Section 1. You will hear a woman talking to a man about joining a drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, Robert Gladwell speaking. Oh, hi. My name's Chloe Martin. I was given your name and phone number by Ben Winters. I work with him and he said you're a member of Midbury Drama Club. Yes, I am. Well... I've just moved to the area, and I'm keen to join a drama club. Great. Yes, I can give you some information. Uh, we're one of the oldest drama clubs in the area, as the club started in 1957. We now have about 60 members. Our youngest member is 10, and our oldest member is 78. The year the drama club started was 1957. So 1957 has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, Robert Gladwell speaking. Oh, hi. My name's Chloe Martin. I was given your name and phone number by Ben Winters. I work with him, and he said you're a member of Midbury Drama Club. Yes, I am. Well, I've just moved to the area, and I'm keen to join a drama club. Great. Yes, I can give you some information. We're one of the oldest drama clubs in the area, as the club started in 1957. We now have about 60 members. Our youngest member is 10... And our oldest member is 78. Oh, I think I saw a picture in the newspaper the other day of some of your members being presented with a prize. Yes, the youth section did very well in a competition and won £100, which will help with their next production. Uh, anyway, uh, tell me a bit more about yourself. Well, I've done a bit of acting. I was in a couple of musicals when I was at university and a historical play more recently. Hmm. We mainly do comedy plays. We get good audiences for that kind of thing. We haven't attempted a musical yet, but we might do one soon. Oh. Uh, when do you usually meet? On Tuesdays. Well, presumably I'll need to do an audition. Yes. There were a few auditions last Tuesday, and we'll be doing more at our next meeting, which is in two weeks' time. That's on Tuesday the 12th of March. There'll be another opportunity two weeks after that, which will be on the 26th of March. Oh, well, I can come to your next meeting, and if I don't get an acting part in a play, I'd be happy to help with something else. I've designed publicity before. Great. We're very short of people who can do that. So that would be really good. There are a lot of people who like making scenery, so we get plenty of help with that, but we haven't got enough people to do the lights at the moment. So, if you think you can do that, or you have any friends who would like to, uh, do bring them along. We can show you what to do if you haven't got any experience. Mm, I'll have to think about it. So, do you meet in the theatre? We do our performances in the Manor Theatre, but we only hire that for the nights of the actual performances. We meet to rehearse every Tuesday evening in the Community Hall. We rent a room there. Oh, I'm not sure where that is. I'll be coming by car because I don't live in the town centre. It's in Ashburton Road. As you're coming towards the centre down Regent Street, you need to turn left at the crossroads.
Oh, I know. There's a big car park down there, just before you get to a hotel. It's on the other side of the road from the sports centre. That's it. That's the closest place to leave your car, and you don't have to pay in the evening to park there. We meet at 7.30, and we usually finish by 9.30 or 10. OK. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I haven't mentioned that we have to make a charge. Everyone pays a subscription of £180 to be a member for a year. You can pay for the whole year at once, or you can pay £15 every month. It works out the same. There are reductions for retired people and under-18s, but I don't think you come into either category. No, I'm 26. Oh, <laughs> that fee covers all the costs, like photocopying of scripts and producing the posters, but it excludes the costumes for the performances. We ask people to pay for the hire of those themselves. It does mean they look after them properly, as they know they won't get their deposit back otherwise. Mm. Can I come along to the next meeting, then? Of course. We'd love to see you. And if you want to know more about how we run the auditions or the next play we're doing, why don't you give our secretary a ring? She'll be really pleased to help you. Oh, what's her name? It's Sarah Sordicott. That's S-A-W-D-I-C-O-T. Oh, got that. And her phone number? I've only got a mobile number for her. Um, just a minute. Uh, let me find it. Ah, yes. It's um, o seven nine double five two four double o six three. Great. Thanks for your help. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You will hear a radio programme in which a presenter called Jasmine tells her colleague Fergus about a charity. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. And now here's Jasmine, who's come to tell us about this week's charity. Hi, Fergus. This week, I'm going to talk about forward thinking and their plans for the Colville Centre. Mm -hmm. So, in recent years, people have realised how useful the arts can be within healthcare. The idea behind forward thinking is to use the arts to promote well-being. 
The charity develops projects for people with special needs and health problems, and also delivers training to healthcare professionals in using the arts, as well as supplying them with information and advice. Forward thinking doesn't just run art and craft classes to distract people who are ill or recovering from illness, but arranges longer-term projects and courses. As it's been shown that the arts can bring all sorts of positive changes in patients, including benefits such as shortening the length of stay in hospital and reducing the amounts of medicine they need. I see. Forward thinking has experience of working with a broad range of people, from young adults with learning difficulties to older people in homes or daycare centres, and people with physical disabilities. The organisation's been around since 1986, and it gradually expanded during the 1990s. Then, in the new millennium, it was decided to find a memorable name. So it's been operating as Forward Thinking for several years. Uh, in fact, since 2005, it's quite a locally based charity, mainly for people in the southern part of this region, which includes all rural and urban communities outside the city of Clifton. Which has its own organisation. There are, of course, some similar charities in other parts of the country, in London and so on. Hmm. And what's the present fundraising in aid of? Yeah. Well, the charity needs funding in order to buy the Colville Centre. This is a former village school which was built in 1868. It was modernised and refurbished by the present owners last year. So it's ideal for art classes and for small social events, performances, seminars, and so on. Forward Thinking is fundraising to purchase the building so they can use it to continue running classes and so on for the general public, and eventually also for some of the people they help. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Pause the recording for thirty seconds. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Right. So, can you give us a few ideas about what classes people might do there? Is it all art classes? Um. Well, there are some very good art classes, but there are lots of other things going on as well. So, for example, there's、ah, learn salsa with Nina Bellina's team. They say that salsa is an easy dance to learn. It's also an excellent form of exercise, according to Nina, and that class is for both men and women, of course. Uh huh. It's ideal for beginners and what they call refreshers. That's a hundred pounds for ten sessions. Then another class is called smooth movers. It's with Kevin Bennett, and it's for you if you don't have the same energy levels as you used to when you were a teenager.、Uh -huh. <laughs> It's a gentle exercise class, geared to the needs of whoever is in the group in a particular session, and Kevin is qualified to teach classes to people getting over injuries and so on, and balance training. That's sixty pounds for ten sessions. Then there's a day called Art of the Forest with Jamie Graham, where you discover Upper Wood. A short walk from the Colville Centre, and learn how to design in 3D with natural materials. It's an unusual and exciting way to be creative. Jamie is an artist with a background also as a country park ranger. Oh! For this day, youngsters must be accompanied by a parent or guardian, and the costs are adults forty pounds, under fourteens ten pounds. But it's best value at eighty pounds for a family of four. The next one is the Money Maze, and this is a series of talks by Peter O'Reilly, an independent financial advisor. He gives advice on family finances, things like everything parents need to know about managing the costs of bringing up children, sending them to university, and actually 
also about care for elderly relatives. It's £10 per talk, which will all go to support forward thinking. And as a final example of what's on offer, there's Make a Play. That's for 8 to 14s. And this activity is such a hit that it usually sells out within days of being announced. Basically, what you do is write, rehearse and perform a play in just two days. And it doesn't require any previous experience. I gather there's lots of fun and silliness along the way. And the best bit, perhaps, is that there's a performance for family and friends at the end. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just £50 for two days. Pretty good range of activities, I think. And all raising money for a good cause. Yes. And the all-important contact details are colville at forwardthinking.org.uk or write... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear two students talking to their tutor about a geography trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Pause the recording for 30 seconds. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Um, now, Stefan and Lauren, you worked together on the assignment for your urban geography course, didn't you? Mm. Mm -hmm. I know you made a plan of what you were going to do before you went on the field trip. Did you stick to it? <laughs> <laughs> More or less. OK. So where did you start? Well... First of all, we selected one area of the city to work in. We decided on the centre. Mm -hmm. And we looked in detail at how it has been developed by doing a survey. Yeah, we did that by walking round and dividing the area into different categories, such as residential, commercial and industrial, so we could record land use. We're going to find some maps from 50 years ago and from 100 years ago so we can look at what has changed. Good. So that gives you a foundation. Mm. Then what did you do? Um, I was interested in looking at how polluted the city was. I thought that was too general a topic and would be difficult to check. But Stefan persuaded me and actually it was quite interesting because before we started, we assumed that a lot of the pollution problems would be caused by industry. In fact, most of the industrial development has been on the outskirts oh. and most pollution is caused by the traffic which passes through the city centre every day. Right. There are five major road junctions around the edge of the city so we set up equipment to check the air quality on each of those three times on one day. In the morning and evening, which is when most journeys are made in and out of the city, and at 2.30 in the afternoon. Hmm. On the same day, we went to the two busiest junctions in the morning and evening to calculate the traffic flow into the city. Right. We'll be able to produce some graphs from the figures we collected. Yeah. Presumably you then looked at where all these cars ended up. 
I thought we should look at why people were coming into the city, um, whether it was for employment or education or leisure activities. But Stefan thought that would be too difficult. <laughs> Because most people were in cars, it would be hard to ask them. Yeah. So we decided to spend an afternoon examining the parking facilities available instead. We established the capacity of each car park, and we spent an afternoon counting cars in and out. So we have an idea of how long people spend in the city centre. So, do you have evidence that most journeys are made by car within the city centre? We checked local government statistics to see if that was true. But they were inconclusive.、Mm. Everything is quite close together in the city centre, and there are wide pavements, so you would expect people to walk from one place to another. So we chose a number of locations, and we noted how many pedestrians passed a particular spot.、Um, how did you choose where to do that? Oh, we stood at two places in the business district, one in the shopping area. And the other was in an area where there are more tourists. Right. I thought it was really important to talk to people, so we carried out a survey on how people usually travelled into the city. We asked them about their usual means of transport. We found out that it varied according to why people were travelling. If they were employed in the city, they wanted to get there quickly, but if they were coming in for their leisure time. They didn't mind using the bus.、Mm. That's all we had time for while we were there. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Pause the recording for thirty seconds. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Okay, so shall we talk about what you're going to do next and how you're going to divide the tasks up?、Mm. How are you going to present the data you've got? Well, some of the information can be presented as graphs or maps. I'm quite good at the software. <laughs> You'd better do that then, Lauren. <laughs> I'll help you check all the statistics before you start. Okay. Um, it's good to present as much as you can visually. Is there anything else you can use as visuals? Uh, we've got a lot of photographs which we can go through. Uh huh. Hmm. We both took them, so some will be duplicated.、Oh, it's going to take ages to go through them all. Maybe one of us should just choose some. Well, it's better if you collaborate. That way, you'll end up with the best of what you've got.、Mm, that's fine. We'll do that.、Mm. And、uh, when the graphs and maps are done, you'll need to write a report, an analysis of the data. Will you do that together? I think that should be my responsibility if we're going to share the work out evenly. I can use some of Lauren's notes as well as my own. Okay, and finally, you'll be presenting your project to the rest of the group in a couple of weeks' time. We thought it'd be better for Stefan to do that, as he's got more experience at that kind of thing.、Hmm. I would prefer to have input from both of you, as I have to do an assessment.、Oh. We'll take turns then. We'll divide it into sections and talk about a few things each. Good. You'll find it easier, Lauren, than doing a presentation on your own. <laughs> well, if you need to ask me any more questions while you're working on this, email me. I look forward to seeing what you produce. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 4. You will hear a lecturer talking to a group of biology students about recent plant studies. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. In the last few weeks, we looked at ways in which different types of animals use their senses. And today, I'm going to introduce the topic of plant behaviour. And we'll look at the reasons why ideas about plants have been changing in the last few years. So, up until fairly recently, Plants' lack of eyes, or ears, or noses, or mouths made them less interesting to many members of the public compared to animal species. And even by scientists, they were generally regarded as organisms which were essentially passive. However, in the last 20 years or so, evidence has started to emerge that plants can sense their surroundings in quite sophisticated ways. But because scientific attitudes towards plants and their capabilities had been fixed for such a long time, this evidence has been met with some disbelief. So, let's look at some of these recent findings that are starting to change the way some scientists view plant life. It all began with a Canadian study that looked at a species of plant known as the Great Lakes Sea Rocket. This is a wild plant which grows on beaches. In appearance, it's perfectly ordinary, with little purple flowers and a long stalk. But actually, the plant is far from ordinary. Normally, when the sea rocket detects other plants growing nearby, it quickly grows additional roots. This is so it can compete with these other plants for the available nutrients in the soil by soaking up as many of them as possible. But scientists found that the sea rocket doesn't do that when the surrounding plants are related to it. And as even animals sometimes find this type of recognition difficult, such a finding was very unexpected. It was an ability that was previously unheard of in any other plant. Since then, it's been suggested the two other plants may have a similar ability. These are sagebrush and thorn apple. It's been claimed that these plants can recognise the characteristics of their neighbours by sensing properties of the light that is reflected from them. The reason they are able to do this is that all plant species are slightly different to each other in this respect. So, each plant species has what you could call its own signature. Sagebrush and thorn apple are able to recognise these. But scientists point out that this behaviour is very different to the way that animals sense things. Another type of plant which can sense things in its surroundings is the dodder plant. This plant is different to most other species, because it doesn't have the ability to make sugar by converting nutrients from the soil. This means that as soon as the dodder has sprouted from a seed, it needs to find another plant in order to survive. In other words, it's a parasite. Dodders infest a variety of food crops around the world as they wrap themselves like string around their target plants and the effect can be devastating for farmers. It's particularly damaging to alfalfa, 
as well as to potatoes and different varieties of citrus. At first, scientists were puzzled as to how the dodder knows which plants to prey on. But now they found that the plant can identify a suitable host by sensing the chemicals that other plants release into the soil and air. What really surprised researchers was how extremely quickly and accurately the dodder identifies a possible host. They used time-lapse videos to study the mechanism and saw from these that when the dodder is trying to check out its environment, it rotates in a circle and then, without touching any other plants, it heads directly towards its selected host. It could sense reliably which type of plant it would grow best on. Scientists who were working on the project reported that the dodder sprout resembled a worm as it moved towards the other plant. Well, those are some examples of the new discoveries about plant characteristics. So which direction is plant science likely to go in next? Many of the phenomena related to plant behaviour that I've just described are now quite easy to observe, using up-to-date equipment. So, gradually, scientists are accepting the fact that plants are more capable than we used to believe. But although such plant behaviour is often obvious to some scientists... That is the end of Part 4. You now have one minute to check your answers to Part 4.